Diagnostic Lab Submissions, Sample Collection and Packaging. This video will help you learn the proper methods to obtain the best possible result from your sample. Diagnostic submissions are extremely useful tools to veterinarians, but can also be costly, so great effort should be taken to get the most effective, accurate results possible. The first step to obtaining a correct diagnostic sample is to select the proper animals to sample. This largely depends on what pathogen is suspected. Acutely infected pigs will give much greater results than chronically infected pigs. You also want to make sure that you are not sending in samples of animals that have already been treated, and if you must, include that in your paperwork. Dead pigs are often selected for sample selection because of the ease of not having to euthanize them. Though convenient, it is important to remember that intestines begin autolysing 15 minutes after death, so attention should be paid to which organs are being collected. Samples should not be taken from a pig after it has been dead for more than four hours. It is extremely important to get samples from the pig as soon as possible after it is euthanized. Often pigs will be euthanized and then left to necropsy after the veterinarian has gone through the rest of the barn, allowing the pig to set for a long period of time. If you have other things to do before necropsying a pig, then move the animal into the alleyway and wait to euthanize it until you are ready to necropsy. Especially with gastrointestinal cases, rapid cooling of the tissue samples immediately after death is very important. After selecting and euthanizing the pig, begin the necropsy. Keep your knife clean by using the cut muscle as a table, shown here. Also remember not to cut the stomach or intestines until last as to not contaminate your knife. Take samples of both lesion tissue and regular tissues, making sure to include the line of demarcation if possible. For fresh samples, you want to get a large sample, but it is also important to remember that if you get too large of a sample, the center may not cool down fast enough and it may begin to autolyze. Remember that it is better to send the diagnostician too many samples than not enough because they can always throw out excess. The D-Lab will sometimes split up fresh tissue between departments, so sending in a sample around the size of a tennis ball is most desirable. For fixed samples, you want to make sure that no section is thicker than one centimeter to allow formalin to penetrate the entire organ. Not allowing formalin to penetrate the tissue will give a tissue that looks like this. If you want to include a larger section of tissue, you may make slices in it like this to allow formalin to penetrate. You want to add formalin in a 10 to 1 ratio to the tissue. Begin by taking out your pluck and get both fixed and fresh samples of lymph nodes and tonsils. Pay special attention if lymph nodes are enlarged and make sure to get samples of those along with samples of regular lymph nodes. Some very important lymph nodes to sample would be the inguinal, tracheal, bronchial, and mesenteric lymph nodes. Different lymph nodes can be sent in the same container because a D-Lab can differentiate between the different lymph nodes. Next, get samples of different sections of lung. Again, if an area is lesioned, include lesioned and non-lesioned tissue. Continue to collect fixed and fresh samples of the heart, liver, kidneys, spleen, stomach, small intestines, and large intestines. Make sure to collect multiple areas of the intestines, three to six inches in length. Finally, rotate the pig and collect samples of the brain. When including brain samples, it is important to get both fixed and fresh samples of the cerebrum and cerebellum. The cerebellum is often forgotten, but it is important for diagnosticians because meningitis often starts in the cerebellum. Remember that you can't send in too many tissues, so it does no harm to send in excess tissue, even if you may not be testing that specific area. They can save tissues in case it is decided to run a different test a couple days later. If you are taking the time to submit a few samples, you might as well include a full set of tissues. Your fixed and fresh tissues may be handled differently. With fixed tissue, it is extremely important not to allow the sample to freeze. If so, they can develop artifact like this and they are not diagnostically valuable. Technically, fixed tissue can stay at room temperature for long periods of time, but it is okay to transport it with the fresh tissue at around 38 degrees Fahrenheit as long as it does not reach low enough temperatures to freeze. Fresh tissue should be placed on ice as soon as possible. It should ideally be transported at 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Diagnosticians prefer it be delivered overnight, but it can be kept at refrigeration temperature for two to three days. Sampling of fluids, such as serum, whole blood, Joint fluid, urine, and feces can also be incorrectly obtained and packaged. Choosing which animal and how many samples to take depends on which pathogen you are testing for. For nasal swab samples, you can either use sterile swabs or swabs with media. The media helps the survivability of the pathogens in the swabs. They should be collected in this manner, and you will often hear the pig sneeze or cough once the swab is inserted correctly. You only need to collect a sample from one nostril and then break off the swab into a falcon tube like this. 
The Falcon tube should contain 0.5 milliliters of sterile saline. It should then be transported at 36 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And like fresh tissue, they prefer overnight delivery, but it can be kept for two to three days. Oral fluids can be very useful to diagnosticians, and it is a very time-efficient way to sample many pigs at once. Though it depends on the amount of tests run, at least one milliliter is needed, and five milliliters is the preferred sample size. These samples should be cooled down to 38 degrees Fahrenheit. Fecal samples can either be collected with a swab or collected in a bag. Diagnosticians prefer samples collected in a bag simply because they have more content to work with. When collecting with a swab, it is much like a nasal swab and should be broken off into a falcon tube and should be put into 0.5 milliliters of sterile saline. If collected in a bag, you should try to include at least 5 milliliters of feces. It would be preferable to take samples directly from a pig and not from the slats because feces on the slats can be contaminated with different bacteria. Whole blood samples can be submitted to the D-Lab for evaluations like toxicology, complete blood chemistries, or some PCRs. When submitting whole blood, you do not want it clotted, so put it in the tube and gently invert the tube to mix up the solution present. Do not overfill the tube, or else the anticoagulants in the tube will not be in the right proportions to the blood to prevent the blood from clotting. As a general rule, try to only fill the tubes half full. Whole blood should be cooled down to around 38 degrees Fahrenheit and should not be frozen. For serum samples, they want the blood to clot so that the serum can be spun off. It actually clots better at a warmer temperature, so it does not need to be immediately cooled down, but can wait to go in the cooler for around 20 minutes to facilitate the clotting process. It should be spun down within 12 hours of collection. You then pour the serum sample off and the sample can be frozen, but if it's kept at 38 degrees Fahrenheit, it should be sent into the diagnostic lab within two to three days. The lab can't process any glass, so it is extremely helpful to pour the serum off into plastic falcon snap cap tubes. Make sure to close the tubes all the way with two snaps. It is helpful to label the serum by one to however many numbers you have and then fill in the corresponding information to the numbers on the submission form. Doing this saves the lab a ton of time and helps you to get speedy, accurate results. It is preferred to mail the tubes in a box like this and not to send the tubes loose in a bag. Do not mail tubes loose in a bag because they often break and spill. The way your samples are labeled and packaged can greatly affect the quality of results you will get back. Separate different cases and clients so that they are not confused and make sure that the paperwork is clearly belonging to one case or another. First, remember to label everything. Often samples will be submitted without labeling what they are or where they came from. For example, urine samples can't easily be distinguished from serum samples, so it is up to the diagnostician to guess what sample was sent in for. Samples are often sent in without individual animal IDs, so that they can't tell which tissues are from which animal. Often you may decide to pool the animals, putting samples together from different animals for testing, but it is still helpful to label everything so that the diagnosticians are clear on what they need to do. It is also important to label which barn and site the sample came from to eliminate any possible confusion. Along with labeling, packaging is often improperly done when sending in samples, which can easily destroy a sample's integrity. The most common error made is not completely sealing the container that formalin is in so that the formalin leaks out and contaminates fresh tissues. The container shown in this picture is the most effective way to package fixed samples, but if they must be in a bag, double bag the sample to lessen the risk of spilling. It is actually illegal to transport liquid materials without double bagging it. Whirl pack bags are great for sending in samples of fresh tissue. Samples from each animal should be grouped together in one bag. Make sure there is a 2 to 1 ratio of ice to tissues. You may add air bags to protect the samples during shipping, but do not add styrofoam pieces or shredded paper to the box. They soak up any moisture in the box and become very messy. It is most preferred to package samples in a styrofoam box instead of a cardboard box because they don't leak, but if it is necessary to ship your sample in only a cardboard box, be sure to place it in a leak-proof bag. The Postal Service will not ship any leaky boxes, charging the diagnostic lab and you a $25 fee and delaying the processing of your sample. Diagnosticians really appreciate it when the sample submission forms are sent in a plastic bag just to be sure that if anything leaks they are still able to read the form. It is also helpful to put any ice packs in a bag in case they leak. Detailed information on requirements of shipping biological samples can be found online. They should be labeled with biological substance category B or with this mark. When submitting your samples to the diagnostic lab, keep in mind that you can never have too much labeling or send in too many samples. 
Fill out every form to the best of your ability and take precautions when packaging. If you ever have any questions, the Diagnostic Lab is more than happy to answer them, and you can contact them by calling this number or emailing this email address. Thank you for watching part one of this module.